My first guest tonight is one of the most influential academics on the planet. Jordan Peterson is a psychologist and author whose work went viral in 2017 through a combination of YouTube lectures, podcast appearances and TV debates. Is gender equality a myth? Men and women aren't the same and they won't be the same. That doesn't mean they can't be treated fairly. He quickly became a lightning rod in the so-called culture war, earning legions of fans and detractors alike, selling five million copies of his book, 12 Rules for Life, in the process. If you overcoddle people, if you protect them from everything that's sharp, you make them dull and stupid and, 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 <laughs> and narcissistic, and it's a really bad idea. He's made no secret of his own battle with depression, and in 2020 found himself in a coma due to a prescription drug addiction following his wife's diagnosis with cancer. Now, he's on the road to recovery, having just released his latest best-selling book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. So I joined him in central London for an in-depth chat. You're such a fascinating figure because clearly you mean a great deal to a huge amount of people, but there's also people that are outraged by you. There'll be some people that are upset that I'm even talking to you. Yeah, no, they're not. They're angry with who their imagination has made me out to be. Right. That's all. Like, I'm a figment of their, of their imagination. Why do people presume that your purpose is somehow to create these angry, um, alt-right incels where I've read all your work? Mm -hmm. I don't hate women. Mm -hmm. I hate everybody. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. That's even-handed. But, 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 but I'm fucking around. But yeah. how frustrating do you find that? You know, it's easy for me to be the representation of the corrupt and tyrannical patriarchy, right? I mean, that, that, that projection fits on me very easily because I'm white, because I'm older, because I've been successful. And if you believe that the, that human hierarchies are basically a consequence of dominance and oppression, and that people who are malevolent and manipulative are most likely to rise to the top, none of which is even vaguely true, by the way, it's just not the case, then I'm the avatar of that particular image, at least for some people. And usually people who think that of me are people who've only heard about me second or third hand. They've never actually listened to anything I said or read anything that I wrote. It feels like the, there's projections from the left. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of the things that you say are then turned into, uh, well, they're also projections from the right, into this kind of like clickbait. Do you know what I mean? Like Jordan yeah. Peterson eviscerates woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you click on it, you go, oh, actually, no, he didn't. There was, no. they had an interesting conversation. Does that frustrate you as well? There's an element of it that's terrifying, right? Because one of the things that really threatens the current stability of our societies is tit-for-tat ideological escalation, Yeah. right? So you might think if you're on the right that the far left is your fundamental enemy. And if you're on the left, you'll think that the far right is your fundamental enemy. But what's everyone's enemy is, you know, I tap you, you poke me, I slap you, you punch me. Those processes can get out of control very, very quickly. And that sort of clickbaity uh, enticement to engage in political dialogue is an enticement to tit-for-tat responding. It's a tremendous danger to us all. Forgive me for this, but you could whittle your books down too. Life is tough. I don't know if I'm going to forgive You're you. You're not going to like this. <laughs> well, but, we'll but, see. but life is tough, and the only way to make it less tough is to try and be the very best version of yourself. Well, how could it be otherwise? I mean... But, but my point being, and my point from that is, that's what I've taken from from your work, you know, I've read both your books, particularly during the last lockdown, and the whole concept of finding a purpose, I found particularly inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anybody's life who isn't enriched by finding a thing they adore and going for it. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you set what's great against what's tragic. Yeah. I mean, but... what else could you possibly do? And so then you say, well, how do you find what's great in your own life? And part of that is you watch, it's like, when is it that I'm doing something that alleviates my suffering, right? Mm. It's real, you have to ask that question to yourself honestly. You do this as a cognitive behavioral psychologist, let's say if you're dealing with someone who's depressed or anxious, it's like so, because you don't know why they're depressed or anxious and neither do they, not really. It's mystery, it's complicated, you know? But one of the things you have them do is say, well, why don't you just watch for a week, like watch yourself like you don't know who you are and just see when you're not quite as miserable, 
Yeah. And then let's see if we can figure out what it is about what you're doing in that situation that's lifting the gloom. It's like, okay, okay, there's something in that that's curative, right? And that's something in that that's curative is related to, well, you might say your purpose. It's like maybe part of the reason you're depressed is because you're too isolated. And now we can work on that. So let's see if we can increase the amount of time you're spending with your friends by like 20%. Or maybe you need a couple of new friends. Or maybe you need to work on your comic material, you know, because you can set that against the tragedy of life. Yeah. I was going to talk about specifically you had, um, you know, some pretty full on health issues. And I was curious, w w were there any kind of, um, any of your, any of the chapters in your book that helped you get through that kind of traumatic time? Well, I wrote the last book almost entirely when I was, I was so ill, I could barely make it to the typewriter. Yeah. So the computer. And so, but it was, it's, look, man, when you're, in the depths of, of catastrophe, you have the support and love of your family if you're fortunate and your friends, and I had no shortage of that, thank God. But I was writing this book and, you know, I wanted to write it and, and it, as far as I was concerned, it was important that I do it and um, that gave me something to live for mm. continually. And you need something meaningful to set against suffering. That's what you have to set against suffering, not happiness. Sometimes you don't have, that's not an option sometimes. Happiness is like, you no, know, I, I don't think I had any happiness at all for three years, pretty much. And what is... It was dire. Well, my wife, she, she spent a year hovering on the brink of death in a variety of different ways. Before that, my daughter had catastrophic health problems, which have mostly resolved. And then I got extremely ill. So we've been in, and at the same time, we were facing social pressure of like an unparalleled magnitude, people mm. trying to, you know, bring this enterprise to a halt, I suppose. If that's probably the right way yeah. to think about it. Most of that time, I was hoping that I would die. I've been grateful for the good things that have happened to me, but I don't think I was grateful enough before just for mundane normality, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you think you don't have everything you could have, and, and perhaps that's true, but if you can sit down and breathe, there's lots of people who don't have that. Yeah. And I read somewhere that you, you couldn't even listen to music. Oh, no. No, no. Why, and just, why, why is well, that? Well, no, I had no positive emotion at all, and, and it was too sensory. Like, I was very sensitive to anything that was, well, any sensory input at all. I mean, Last year, when I was in Florida, I I would get up at about eight in the morning because I couldn't sleep anymore, and then I would I'm pretty much on the couch till three. But I had to have ear earplugs in and uh, like a covering over my eyes. At that, that point, I could still lay down, so I could, I could well I wasn't resting, but I at least wasn't moving. So I'm curious with you. Do you remember the first song that you were able to listen to when you came out of your illness? I think it was probably something by Arcade Fire. Right. So I really like Arcade Fire. I think they're great. Yeah. Um, and what so, was that? That must have just been to be able to... Oh, man, it was such a relief. And now I've been listening to music like mad. My wife and I, we spend about five hours a week dancing upstairs in our... That's all right. Like for a long time, two years, every evening I spent with her, I thought would probably be the last one. Yeah. So the fact that that's not the case anymore and that we can listen to music. I have these long playlists that I've been curating for years that we have an oldies romance playlist that's jazz singers from pretty much the 20s through the 50s, some 60s stuff. I'm curious as well, you know, when you're kind of cur cur curating these kind of like playlists, are you able to be in the zone or are you are you watching her reaction to the music? Because that's always the thing I Well, I with. tend to put the playlist together and then our rule is she has veto power. And so, you know, if I, there's a song on there that she doesn't want to listen to repeatedly when we're driving in our car or whatever, then I'll take it off. And, yeah. And she is very good at deciding when something shouldn't be around anymore and getting rid of it. Yeah. So, which was always terrifying, by the way, to our children when they had friends come over because <laughs> when they first come over, we'd tell them, we're really happy that you're here, you know, and you're welcome, and we meant it. I think teenagers are pretty funny with their caustic sense of humor and their proclivity to misbehave. But the second part of the message was, but, but if you do anything stupid, 
and we never have to see you again, that actually isn't a problem for us. It's, hang on, so, hang on. Is that how you would greet them with that? Yes. That is fucking terrifying. Yeah, well, it was so, so funny, you... though, because they were terrified of me when they first came over, which was yeah. a good thing. But after they'd been over five times, they weren't terrified of me. Of course. But they were definitely terrified of Tammy. Right. So, yeah, because she, she has a stronger spine than me in many ways. Because I'm a very, as it turns out, I'm a very agreeable person. I don't like conflict at all. Yeah. And, and she's, she's, she's a little more stiff stiff-spined in that regard, so. I, you described comedians yeah. as being uh, canaries <clears throat> in the coal mine. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Well, you know, in a, in, in a king's court, the fool is the only person who can tell the truth, right? That's the purpose I mean, of the fool. If the king can't stand the fool, then he's a tyrant. That's how, and that's one of the best ways you can tell if people are fundamentally tyrannical. That comedian should be shut down. How dare he say that? It's like, oh yeah, okay. We know who you are. You're not the fool. You're not the comic. You're the tyrant. Did you see that thing the other day? There was a death metal performer, and she uh, she got someone out of the crowd, and the bloke led down, and she urinated on him. Now, I don't go to death metal gigs. Um, it's not my thing. But I would imagine if you're a fan of death metal, and the the singer of your band pisses on your face, You'd probably never wash again. Well, no. <laughs> but, but the point being, that made it to the papers. And that mm. became a shocking thing. And it's like, how the fuck are we shocked by what happens at a death metal gig? And, and the singer had to issue an apology. And, and the thing that fascinated me, I doubt the guy that was peed on was upset. I doubt the audience were upset. And yet we are now, because it's come to the mainstream, well, go, well, rough, you shouldn't eh? behave like that it's at a death well, metal it's, gig. It's rough, eh? Because artist types always push the boundaries. Yeah. I mean, they actually exist technically on the boundaries. So yeah. there's the personality trait, openness to experience. And it's an evolved trait. And it's, it's the trait that we associate with creativity. Yeah. And those creative people live on the edge. And they cause trouble out there, right? They're mucking about with categories and traditions all the time, but also improving them and updating them and inventing new businesses and all of that. And making mistakes. Uh, and so yes, and that's right. And making, that's, that's right, you know. Generally, when you're engaged in a creative project, there's quite a bit of accompanying mess. Yes. And how could there not be? Because you have to learn, and you have to learn through trial and error. You have to overshoot the mark. That happens with comics all the time. And it's, it's not optional, that laughter and comedy. We live in an era of cultural division. So how do we kind of, how do we heal that? Well, I think one of the things that we could do is try hard to see when those across the political aisle from us do something that we at least regard as not entirely stupid and offer a little reward. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, like, as far as like, catchphrases go, that's long. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 is, but isn't that, the, but there you go. But it's, it's such an interesting, because it feels like, because of the way communication is set up, where you, you deal like social media, yeah. like you say, everything's flying around. Most people are in a constant state of becoming. Yeah. They're a bit confused. Yeah. And yet, it feels like, how do we, the confused middle, get to some place of solution? Unless you're living in paradise, you're stupider than you should be. And because you're stupider than you should be, you're probably wrong about something. Mm. And the person most likely to correct something you're wrong about is someone that you disagree with because they know things, at least in principle, mm. that you don't know. But that's the core of it, isn't it? That's the core of making things better. We don't know everything. We open ourselves up to the possibility of learning and updating. Mm. And free speech is one of the mechanisms by which that occurs, one of the primary mechanisms by which that occurs, if not the mechanism itself. Yeah. You have to be ignorant, but you don't have to not admit your ignorance. The idea of traveling again and, and touring again, that must fill you with joy. Oh yes, it's an unbelievable privilege and opportunity. I mean, we planned all this when I was still like 98% dead because we tried to live as if life was possible. Yeah, and when will you be touring in the sort of UK and Europe? June, June and July, and then in September again. Fantastic. Yeah. Absolute joy, thank you, sir. Thank you. Real pleasure. Man. My pleasure.